Thank you for joining me at the uh, Understanding the Rohingya Crisis, Race, Religion, and Violence in Burma. My name is Elliot Prasi Freeman. I'm a graduate candidate here in the Anthropology Department. And I'm honored to be joined by this esteemed panel, but also saddened at the circumstances that have brought us here. Um, I'm going to start by thanking the people who have made this possible. We've had uh, generous support from the Pointer Fellowship in Journalism, which has brought Francis Wade, the author of the new book um, on Myanmar's Muslims and the violence that's being done to them. Uh, and then we also were able to bring a number of other people here through the support of the Council for Southeast Asian Studies here and the Macmillan Center and the Shell Center for International Human Rights. Um, I'm going to go through some intros really fast to tell you who these people sitting in front of you are. Then we're going to, I'm going to do a little bit of background on the Rohingya slash Rohingya uh, people and the conflict that has uh, splashed across the headlines over the last couple of months. Then I'm going to hand it over to Francis and then the rest of the panel to speak. Uh, that'll probably take us through about... 515, at which point we're going to open it up to uh, your comments. And we have a lot of people in this room who have experience with Myanmar and the region, and we're, we want them to contribute as well. Uh, last but not least, we have a film screening of a short film. It's about, it's a little over 15 minutes long. On uh, It's called Sitwe, which is one of the cities in Rakhine State, and it features a Muslim woman, young woman, and a, a Buddhist young man and kind of tells the conflict through their story. It was obviously done before this recent bout of violence, but it is quite timely um, given what has happened since. Um, okay, so in terms of who you're looking at today, um, we have Francis Wade, uh, the, the person, the reason why we're here in the first place, uh, is a journalist specializing in Myanmar and Southeast Asia. He began reporting on Myanmar in 2009 uh, with the exiled media uh, concern called Democratic Voice of Burma, based in northern Thailand, before going uh, to cover in depth the transition from military rule to this new uh, quasi-democratic system that we have now. In, as he did that, he got more and more involved in the story of both uh, the Rohingya people and the uh, challenges that the rest of Myanmar Muslims are, are facing. His book is called, which published uh, in Zed Books in 2000, August of 2017, is Myanmar's Enemy Within, Buddhist Violence and the Making of a Muslim Other. So go buy that. <laughs> then we have uh, Cho San Hlai, is an ethnic Rakhine Burmese activist working in Arakan State. His organization, the Kinta Peace and Development Institute, is one of the only local organizations working to foster dialogue between Rohingya and Rakhine people. Currently, he is an Alliance for Historical Dialogue and Accountability fellow at Columbia University, working on a project documenting stories of the victims of the communal violence in the area. And he grew up there, and often we, people uh, don't get an insider's view of, of what it's like to grow up in these areas and to live with them, and he'll be able to provide us with insights on his work today and also what it looked like in the recent past. Then we have a recent uh, joiner to the panel, uh, Umyo Nguyen, who's the director of the Smile Education Development Foundation in uh, Rangoon, or Yangon, depending on, on your uh, proclivities. Founded in 2007 in response to rising intolerance and discrimination in Burma. So this is someone who can talk not only about the Rohingya issue, but also the broader context of, of challenges of interfaith, inner uh, ethnic, interracial harmony or lack thereof in the country. And finally, uh, last but not certainly not least, uh, is James C. Scott, a political scientist, and, well, lapsed political scientist, hopefully now anthropologist. Uh, who is uh, a comparative scholar of agrarian and non-state societies, subaltern politics, and anarchism with a particular focus on Burma. And he'll be able to provide some context and some uh, insights on where we're going from here. So um, one of the more contentious issues about the Rohingya is who are they um, from uh, 
Burmese nationalist perspective, or from a, really a Burmese perspective, almost across society, where there's very little agreement on anything, there seems to be a consensus uh, these days that the Rohingya are not from the, the land of Burma itself. Now, they've been um, concentrated in this area, what's called Rakhine State, to the west of the country, as particularly to the north, close to, to Bangladesh. And the narrative that, or the belief, is that these people have come in th with the colonial encounter when the British governed Burma as part of uh, broader India. And so at this point, there were no nation state borders that people could cross, and the British liked the Indians for their uh, ability to speak English, their um, networks that took them beyond the province of Burma. And so uh, there was a huge amount of people from South Asia that came into the country at that that point. Now, um, the unfortunate part of this narrative is that it cuts off everything that came between it. And one of the things that, that Jim Scott focuses on in his work is uh, to try to upend a kind of tyranny of the map that prevents us from seeing into the, the past without those lines on the map that would divide spaces that weren't so tidally divided. And what I mean by that is that uh, Rakhine kingdoms weren't tidally contained in that area, but rather were fluctuating, kind of like accordions, and they got bigger and smaller. And these places, these kingdoms, tended to uh, make themselves run through the collection of bodies to work in uh, wet rice plantations, essentially. And people don't really like to do that, as he shows, uh, and they, they, they run away. And so what happens is that these uh, societies were supported by slave gathering, uh, and just massive population movements in general. So these uh, historical, historiographical, I guess, discourses about what, uh, you know, the people were always there and these are interlopers, neglect the fact that people were flooding across what are now borders for a very long time. And the people who now see themselves as Rohingya likely came during this pre-colonial period. Um, that, I'm going to skip over a bunch of history uh, that I think my colleagues can better speak about, but I wanted to give that a little bit of, of background first, and then kind of bring us up to, to speed and the current violence and situate that in just uh, in, ter in terms of what's happened so that Francis doesn't have to spend too much of his time going over that. Um, basically, since 2012, there's been an, uh, a number of conflagrations of violence that have forced uh, Rohingya out of the country. Uh, there was a recent attack in 2016, and then uh, people who are claiming to represent the Rohingya in 2017 called the um, All Rohingya Solidarity Army. Arakan Rohingya. Arakan Rohingya. Arakan Rohingya. Rohingya. Thank you. Um, struck an coordinated attack on a bunch of military posts. This was used as pretense by the Myanmar army to strike back in uh, with extreme prejudice against not just the people who were responsible for these actions, but also the entire population. So we're talking 280 villages destroyed, uh, thousands of houses um, torched, and 600,000 people ultimately pushed across the border into Bangladesh. And this slide shows um, generally some of the uh, where people have ended up in the diaspora, and all thanks to Al Jazeera, from whom I took these lovely maps. Um, now, in terms of the political situation now, the Rohingya are largely uh, effectively stateless, and they don't have citizenship bec for a number of reasons that the, my colleagues can speak about. But more importantly, I think, uh, even if they did, it wouldn't necessarily matter. And what I mean by that is uh, there are some Rohingya who gave up claims to their uh, ethnicity, they took the name Bengali, this is in Miebon, and they were given the pink card of citizenship that is supposed to allow you to enter into the, the fold of the nation, and they still weren't allowed to leave their village. So this is a deeper issue than just having citizenship. This is a, a kind of complete othering of a population to the point where they're not <coughs> accepted as part of the fabric of society. And so hopefully today we'll be able to talk about 
why that is and what it means to belong in this country at this particular moment of democratization when markets are opening up, resources are flooding in, and perhaps who you are and to which group you belong uh, helps pr will predicate whether you can access those resources, whether you can be a part of, of the country. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Francis, and he's going to be able to explain what he found in his book, and um, we'll go from there. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Elliot. Um, as I understand, there's been some coverage of the most recent violence in the press here, probably not enough as ever. Um, it's a situation that I think many of us had been warning might happen for several years now. Um, one of those kind of sad, desperate tales of the world waking up to a crisis, perhaps too little, too late. Um, the accounts, many of which I'm sure you've seen, have been pretty appalling. Um, I was in Bangladesh in September, mid to late September, um, and by that point, 400 odd thousand Rohingya had crossed over um, in what is believed to be the most concentrated refugee flow since the Rwanda genocide. Um, so there were upwards of 100,000 crossing each week. Um, Many were in a deplorable mental, physical condition. Um, because the Myanmar government has largely blocked access to northern Rakhine State, where this campaign, where this military campaign has happened, um, to outside observers, we've had to rely on eyewitness testimony, try to triangulate that with um, satellite imagery in order to build at least a partial picture of what's happened. Um, as Elliot said, 200 odd villages have been partially or totally destroyed. The Myanmar military has committed massacres in concert with Rakhine civilians. Um, and I visited several hospital wards in Bangladesh while I was there. And there were, they were full of people with very serious wounds, um, children with bullet wounds, um, burns from when their houses have been torched. It does appear to have been an indiscriminate campaign, um, despite both the government and the military uh, professing it to be a targeted counterinsurgency um, operation. While I think a lot of these reports have shocked, so too has the response from inside the country, both from the government and from the civilian populace, who seems to have uh, almost rallied in support of the military. And that's what I want to explore here, um, to try and, I guess, look at things from the perspective of the population, um, from those either perpetrating or supporting the violence. Because while I think there's been a lot of coverage of the results of the violence, there's been less sort of investigation into the motivations that have driven it. Um, I think this kind of crisis would be shocking anywhere in the world. Perhaps it's more so in Myanmar because of certain preconceived ideas that many of us had about, um, about the country and about a population that had for so long seemed very resistant to the divisive politics of the military, um, had been steadfastly in opposition to military abuses, um, which the majority of the population had suffered from themselves. Um, and so that's the first thing I'd like to address, how the Rohingya have been... So we have, this, we have this community of stateless persons that are essentially quarantined in a corner of the country. Um, Elliot said they're concentrated there, but I think there's more to it than that. They're not really allowed to leave that part of the country. Um, and yet they still become this source of national hysteria. And I think it's because they've been constructed, or largely because they've been constructed as a threat to the national community um, or society, both in Rakhine State and more broadly. Um, so that is the first thing I'd like to address, how they've been constructed as a threat, as an enemy of such magnitude that for decades they've required containment, controlling, and now expulsion. Um, and as I said, while I think the shock of the outside world is understandable, it's also been to a degree fed by quite a binary vision that I think we had of the state and society in Myanmar. 
um, which was formed during military rule, but still seems to linger of this bad military versus kind of good, virtuous society. Um, that's been completely upended now. Um, and I think it's worth looking at what's happened to radically upset that quite conventional view um, and how wrong and dangerously so many of us were to believe in such a sort of simplistic state society dichotomy in the first place. Um, so that's the second point. The final point that I'll look at, why does this threat, the threat that the Rohingya pose, why does that need to be addressed now? Um, as Myanmar appears to be moving very falteringly towards a democracy of sorts. Um, is this violence a bug in the democratization process, or is it, in fact, a product of democratization? Um, <clears throat> I think for those of us who have been watching the spread of religious violence across the transition, um, this has been, uh, you know, quite a frightening, quite a shocking experience, but it's not necessarily new. At least this show of loathing for the Rohingya isn't especially new. So I want to kind of go back a little bit and look at some of the context for this. Um, and I'm picking all the various strands to what's happening now. Uh, it would take days, weeks. We haven't got the room for that long. So I think I'll just focus primarily on first and foremost, why and how they've been constructed as a threat. Because I think it's that that sort of underpinned why the population feels they need to be completely rid of them, why it's supporting what is essentially a campaign of ethnic cleansing. Um, as Elliot mentioned, over the past five years, there have been several waves of violence between Rakhine Buddhists and Muslim Rohingya. Those have been more communal in their expression, at least, than the current one, which is an overt military campaign with civilian support. Um, and when I've spoken with Rakhine nationalists in particular who have participated in previous acts of violence against Rohingya, um, there's often this refrain, this common refrain that is that goes sort of, you know, if we don't protect our race, if we don't protect our people, if we don't protect our nation, then it will be destroyed. And that was a fear that was very much pushed by the military, very deliberately so. Um, and some of you may be aware of the slogan of the immigration ministry that went, the earth, quote unquote, the earth won't swallow a race to extinction, but another race will. So it both evokes this idea of a threat, either in the country or outside of the country, um, but also this idea which has been central to the nationalist ideology of the military, which is that there's one sort of cohesive us in Myanmar. Um, and that narrative of an indigenous us pitched against them, outsiders of sort of varying guises, um, extends way back before this current show of violence. And it kind of prompts what is an obvious statement that what's happened now hasn't emerged from thin air. Every campaign of mass violence the world over has particular processes, both large and small, so sort of local, national, political engineering, hyperlocal antagonisms between groups and individuals. Um, and Myanmar is no different. I only really have time to look at what's happened since 2012. Um, and I'm grateful for Elliot the detail in some of the history prior to that. Um, the reason why I'll begin in 2012, when the first wave of violence happened between Rohingya and Rakhine, is because I see that as a vital precursor to what's happening now. Um, it really, I suppose, marked a turning point in the relations between the two communities of the state and really began to shape or reshape perceptions of Rohingya amongst the broad swathe of Myanmar society. Um, and hopefully Jo san will talk a bit more about this, but prior to the 2012 violence, according to both Rakhine and Rohingya who I've spoken to since, um, there was there were intercommunal relations, so they both traded, both communities traded in the marketplaces together, they used to sit in the same tea shops. From what I could tell, they had uh, an informal social engagement that many, if not enjoyed at least, uh, willingly tolerated. 
that all changed very quickly and very dramatically after the 2012 violence, which began in June and lasted around four days, um, and led to the destruction of several Muslim neighborhoods in Sitwe and villages elsewhere. Both Rakhine and Rohingya villages were destroyed. After that, Rohingya were confined to camps, villages, ghettos. Um, this apparatus of control grew up in the state that was targeted at the Rohingya. <coughs> And that seemed to have a curious, curious effect. Um, Rakhine had enthusiastically backed this control measures, this segregation, because it meant the Rohingya would be further contained. Mm -hmm. um, but from what I could gather, it really began to sort of animate this idea that the Rohingya presented a threat to the Rakhine people, to Rakhine society. Um, the segregation measures, the camps that grew up, the um, sort of confinement of Rohingya to particular areas didn't seem to provide or sort of instill an ease within Rakhine people. Um, it almost, well, it did widen communal fissures, but it also, I suppose, hardened fears that Instead, inside of these camps, inside of these villages, inside of these ghettos, there was something uh, sinister lurking. And because there was no interaction um, between Rakhine and Rohingya after the 2012 violence, it meant that there was no real sort of countervailing inter inter information that would have corrected those thought patterns. So they really began to lock in and kind of fester. Um, and I think that was the most insidious effect of the initial segregation that began in 2012. Not the material losses um, that it caused, but more the, I suppose, deep sort of psychological effect it had on amplifying fears about the Rohingya, about this community, and therefore heightening the potential for more violence to take place. Um, and this kind of acute segregation, I think, created what was an enabling environment for these perceptions of the Rohingya as a threat to develop and harden, and not just individual Rohingya, but the entire community. Um, and after 2012, after that violence, as is often the case with violence that happens along sort of ethnic lines or identity lines, Rakhine and Rohingya sharply retreated into these sort of separate physical enclaves um, that soon became sort of mental enclaves as well. Um, and that caused group identities to sharpen dramatically, and it caused people to really sort of look inwards um, for sort of solidarity, security, rather than looking outwards. Um, and so it seemed as if the more sort of structural repression of the Rohingya didn't resolve the fears that Rakhine felt of them. It almost excited them further. And this was helped along hugely by an uptick in information that was being circulated by Rakhine and by sort of local and state media more broadly um, about the Rohingya. Um, that they were this sort of crusading force bent on destroying the Rakhine identity um, and that of Buddhism more broadly. And initially, a lot of that information that began circulating in 2012 referenced the rape and murder of a Rakhine woman by three Rohingya men, which had provided the trigger for the first wave of violence in June 2012. But it did it in a way that um, made it not the, not merely the act of sort of you know, three craven individuals, not something that was isolated from the broader dynamic between Rakhine and Rohingya, but more as a direct expression of everything that was dangerous in that dynamic between the two groups. Um, and when local and state media reported on that rape and murder, they often included the designators Muslim or Bengali in brackets after the suspect's name in a way that made it seem as if the group identity was at fault. Um, and I think that really sort of illustrates the kind of mental shift that began to occur um, around 2012 in, uh, in how, I guess, individual actions by Rohingya were interpreted in group terms, um, and therefore eventually, as we're seeing, why it was necessary to respond against the entire group rather than individual wrongdoers within the group. Um, and 
over time we had calls from Rakhine monks, Rakhine politicians to completely break ties with Rohingya. Um, there are Rakhine people who are caught selling rice to Rohingya or smuggling medicine into camps. They would be beaten, paraded with a traitor sign around their neck through towns. Um, leaflets began to be distributed around the state capital, Sitway, and other towns that um, attacked international aid groups who were assisting Rohingya because they had been, quote unquote, watering poisonous plants, i.e., keeping alive a kind of toxic presence um, in Rakhine society. And this idea of the sort of malevolent Rohingya, I think, really became a staple of the Rakhine imagination. Um, and more broadly, uh, the Burmese imagination across the country, and we'll kind of get onto that. Um, I think there's a fundamental point that the kind of propaganda that began to be circulated in 2012 and the kind of propaganda that circulated since the insurgent attacks in August um, has tried to make. And some of you may have seen the sort of the memes, the pictures that are going around of you know, Rohingya babies carrying machetes and so on. Um, I think its principal message is that all Rohingya and not just the nascent insurgency need to be dealt with. Um, and I've spoken with countless Rakhine over the years who speak of a kind of Rohingya male malevolence that's sort of almost inborn, innate, that they have bad blood, that it's not something that can be reasoned with or educated out of them, um, and therefore needs to be sort of exercised altogether. Um, there is a very popular belief that the Rohingya identity is a political construct, in contrast to um, Rakhine, the Rakhine ethnicity or the Burma ethnicity, moreover, which is believed to be something more, I suppose, primordial or natural. Um, and because of that, there's a belief that Rohingya are claiming to be an indigenous group so they can claim citizenship that would then give them a platform to do whatever one believes they want to do with the country, either Islamize it or succeed from it. There are sort of varying narratives. Um, the narrative then goes that because the Rohingya identity is a political project in of itself, then everyone who subscribes to, Rohingya, to the Rohingya identity is party to that project um, and therefore is sort of collectively responsible for the actions of a few within it. So it's a way of looking at things in very binary terms. So, you know, they who act as one in the service of that identity, we as another defending against their, I suppose, sinister project. Um, and we need to recognize that in Myanmar, these narratives are playing a fundamental role in conditioning, shaping um, the, the violence, um, and I suppose determining how it's mutated from what had been local communal violence into something more substantial that's brought in the military um, and attracted support for the military. Um, the fear of the Rohingya that really took hold after 2012 seemed to have a contagious effect and began to be voiced by communities um, across the country that probably had little to no contact with Rohingya. Um, and the rationales behind this fear varied. So Rakhine will often talk in more, I suppose, material, uh, material terms. So speaking of how Rohingya have taken their land, overwhelming their resources. But outside of Rakhine state, a more existential fear began to develop. Um, the Rohingya are the vanguard of a uh, crusade to Islamize the country. Um, weaken Buddhism, and it placed the more recent insurgency within a kind of universal narrative of uh, crusading Islamism. Um, and I think because the religious dimension has been pushed so unremittingly in local media, state media, um, it's had the effect of drawing in a far larger community of resistors and therefore kind of enlarging the in-group dramatically. Um, so it's almost broadened the identity component of the conflict beyond what had been a local contestation in Rakhine state between Rakhine and Rohingya ethnic groups um, to something much larger and which has ramifications for the health of the entire country. 
the second topic I wanted to tackle briefly was this quite binary, um, sort of bad military, good state, um, good society view that many had of Myanmar. That's now unraveled quite dramatically. We have so-called Democrats, uh, we have monks espousing deeply hateful views of the Rohingya community. Um, they have high authority, great influence, people listen to them. Um, I won't say a great deal on this, but except to say that I think it provides a universal lesson of sorts, because there have been very little interrogation of uh, the political opposition during military rule. And it seemed that there, there was a kind of assumption that because they stood against the military, that meant they stood for democracy and for equal rights for all, um, without any sort of deep questioning of, and particularly of senior figureheads within the National League for Democracy, um, of what their vision for society was beyond the instalment of Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy, what kind of qualities it might seek in a new society, um, how and if it would begin to tackle the deep prejudices that the military cultivated, um, how it would bridge the sort of uh, the very divisive politicking of the military. And I think there's a feeling that Suu Kyi and the pro-democracy movement more broadly has betrayed its ideals, but I think beyond its broad appeals to quite a vague conception of democracy, we didn't really know what those ideals were. Um, and that, I think, provides a cautionary tale for other transitional societies um, who have an opposition that's almost breathlessly endorsed by Western governments without much interrogation of their vision or without much appreciation of what might have come before them, which in Myanmar's case was a military which heavily manipulated ethnic religious identities that cultivated these violent co contestations over who belongs and who doesn't. Um, and as we're seeing, that's had an insidious effect on the country, um, and one that I think functions well beyond the party level, um, and which will take more than just political engineering to really challenge. That brings me to the third topic, uh, which is the link between the violence and the political transition. Um, and I've tried to imagine what might cause that, curious but familiar paradox of an advancing democratization process and worsening violence. Um, and of course there is a history of communal antagonism in Rakhine State and for sure there are Rakhine nationalist politicians and Burma politicians more broadly who see violence as politically profitable um, in the sense that particularly violence along ethnic lines often causes people to identify more closely with their ethnic group. And if there's a representative party, um, then that often translates into support for that party, ergo votes should an election come round. Um, so I think there's definitely been some um, machinations on, some strategic machinations on the part of Rakhine um, politicians. But I think we also need to look close at military rule and the fears and anxieties that this produced in the populace, because it seems to be the case that in Myanmar, there's a fear that democratization, if it isn't pursued selectively, um, could in fact weaken the standing of particular groups like the Rakhine, rather than enfranchising them. And again, I don't really have enough time to unpack this fully, but I think one can make a broad statement that the military during its time in power, and this is something that Elliot's done some work on, um, greatly limited the conferring of political rights on the population to the degree that those rights um, appeared to be finite. Um, and so this naturally gives rise to a fear that were one community to be enfranchised via democratization, then another community would be uh, disempowered. So, in the case of the Rakhine and Rohingya, if the Rohingya were brought into the national community and if they were to enjoy the supposed fruits of democratization, so political enfranchisement, economic gain, access to resources, then they would be gifted a platform that would allow them to rise to an equal footing as Rakhine. 
and therefore begin this steady change in status or position um, between Rakhine and Rohingya. And that fear of group status being reversed, of these supposedly age-old hierarchies being upended, um, is a classic trigger for mass violence, and particularly so when that group is considered foreign, um, who, whose interests, whose cultures, belief systems are deeply at odds with um, profess indigenous groups. Um, and there are a few other periods in a country's political development that better allow for this potential change in status between groups than democratization, given the enfranchising effect that it supposedly has. Um, and so this might be why the calls for the expulsion of the Rohingya are being voiced as loudly by self-styled Democrats as anyone else, because the military's campaign is seen to be in defense of a nascent democracy whose fruits or whose gains are understood to be limited. Um, in that logic, ridding the country of this competing group uh, would make others better able to prosper if they remained than the fragile status of the Rakhine or others um, in a change in society would be eroded. So we have democratization in Myanmar as almost a zero-sum game. Um, and therefore a potentially perilous venture in less rival groups like the Rohingya, who are feared to be competing for limited uh, rights and resources, are constrained or, as we're seeing now, expelled from the country. Um, and this, I think, helps to explain why the military is now seen in the public eye to be acting defensively, not aggressively, both because the Rohingya are believed to be threatening, um, to those who claim the nation for themselves and that democratization is also threatening unless it's executed very carefully, five minutes. Um, and this reframing since 2012 of you know, who the Rohingya are as a kind of single unit of nefarious intent um, has meant that there's no disaggregation of the individual from the group. Um, and that's provided a very powerful foundation for the kind of um, public support we've seen for a campaign of ethnic cleansing. It's also why we have this acute polarity between the international community and uh, the local community in terms of how violence is interpreted. The international community see a marauding army attacking a defenseless population. The domestic constituency in Myanmar, or at least the, a large cross-section of it, appears to see the military acting defensively. Um, and I think that kind of throws up how uh, nuanced, how complex the situation is in the country. Um, because what's driving these, this violence isn't merely deep-seated prejudices. Um, the military cultivated this idea that were anyone free to make a claim on the nation um, and were all groups to be enfranchised, then those who are really deserving of democratic gains would lose out. Um, and it had quietly hinted that democratization could be a perilous venture. And I think we're seeing the results of the fears that that produced um, being exercised now. Just a quick final point. Um, to bring this into the present, as well as the need to gain uh, a much more deeper understanding of the context of all this, I think we now need to pay very close attention to what's happening in the country, um, the future for Northern Rakhine State. Um, and particularly the demands being voiced by various governments for the repatriation of the Rohingya um, without really understanding what they might go back to. The military strategy appears to be one of forcible population transfer. Um, from what we know of its past behavior, this, will, this clearance operation will allow it to um, essentially reorganize the social and security landscape of Rakhine State. Um, and it's historically used campaigns against ethnic minorities as a way to project its power into parts of the country where it's felt lacking and as a means to better able better control and um, administer populations. It's only been three months since this latest campaign began, but already we're seeing plans being laid by the government and the military um, that uh, push this idea of a kind of reclamation or recolonization of what was Rohingya land. Um, and the government has already said that 
the land on which Rohingya villages once stood will become the property of the state. Um, Rohingya crops um, that were left by fleeing Rohingya will be harvested by the state and redistributed amongst the local population, which is now predominantly Buddhist. Um, and that Rohingya who are allowed to return will be placed in what appears to be a repatriation camp that was announced this morning, actually. Um, and I think we all fear that these will essentially be replicas of the internment camps that Rohingya have been confined to for five years now elsewhere in the state. Um, but while there's an effort to contain and gradually weaken the Rohingya, there's also what seems to be an effort to um, expand the presence of Buddhists in what was a Rohingya-dominated area. Um, and in the early 90s, the military began a program to resettle um, Buddhists in model villages in northern Rakhine state um, in a bid to break up the Muslim community and to provide evidence that this is, in fact, Buddhist land. Um, and I guess you could draw a parallel with the Israeli uh, settlement project in the West Bank, so an effort to essentially colonise land by incentivising people to relocate there. And actually, a couple of years ago, Josan and I travelled to northern Rakhine State, and we found some of these model Buddhist villages, um, some of whom were composed entirely of homeless people from Yangon or former prisoners who had been given early release in exchange for relocating to northern Rakhine State. And they were gifted a house, they were gifted a cow, land to till, um, as part of this colonisation drive. Um, and since August this year, the government has mooted the idea of extending this network of Buddhist villages, um, likely on the sites of burned Rohingya villages. And there's an evident conviction that this land must be taken back from Rohingya, um, that there must be this demographic engineering to prove that it's Buddhist land. Um, and the cleansing effectively provides space for it to do this. The land has to be cleaned before it can be reborn. Um, and I'll just quote the Rakhine State Secretary who said recently, and he'll be a chief player in what happens in Rakhine State from now on. He said recently of the Rohingya that, quote unquote, this is not their land, they are not the real owners. The owner is the nation, our ancestors, we will never give them away. So I think this effort to take back the cleansed areas of Rakhine State speaks to the fact that we can't view what's happened over the past three months as an isolated campaign, um, as a response to a trigger event, but as part of a much longer strategy. Um, and the years of demonization of the Rohingya, their construction as a threat, um, has, I think, been vital to building public support for what is essentially a campaign of state expansion. Um, and particularly so now because they've been framed as a threat to the limited democratic gains that are available in Myanmar. I think it's vital that we take this bigger picture, this longer view, um, going forward when we analyse exactly what's been happening and where things are likely to go, because I think it enables us to see it as part of a larger state-crafted project, and without that we miss uh, a fundamental part of the bigger picture. So I'll end on that very pessimistic note. Thank you, Francis. Um, Cho San Lai, who's a Rakhine activist who works on interfaith and youth issues, is going to speak now about some of his experiences. Yeah. Hello. Uh, let me introduce. Hello. Let me introduce you formally. My name is Cho San. I'm from Northern Rakhine State. I born there. So I grew up there. So I run the organization, and that organization promotes uh, uh, social harmony and uh, yeah, so human rights awareness. So myself also is an ex-political prisoner. I was exiled in Thailand for nine years. In the Colombia, I'm, I'm looking at like memory walk, what happened in my city. So. So I would like to highlight two things. Uh, I will say like related with the French as well, as well as the, the famings. So the faming what they're talking about. So when I live in Rakhai, so like we can say, we can say study together, we can play together until 2012. 
and then we don't have much like we don't like for like for a child or for like student, so we don't see any like differences. We can go along together, but the, I think the problem is the family or the problem is with the people who are illic. They are just generating the generating the disco. So, in 2012, I was there, and uh, recently, like 2016, attack. Also, 2017 August, I was there in Northern Rock High State. So, what happened? My organization 2000, after 2017 August attack. So the whole our operation have to postpone, and the offices are closed down. And so also, so, so now, so also the uh, like so, as a require in the international community, like we are like really the bad people, and then we are against the Rohingya. So this also like also the Rakai had this also like anti the Rohingyas that disco. So I would like to highlight why say, we had this kind of the disco. So like say, uh, I would like to say about the like Second World War, the Rohingyas are allied with the British, and British give them the favor, and they and then the Rakhai are disempowered. So like and so, so Rakhai feel very angry, and then so when the Japanese came to. Burma, Rakai, and Japanese favored Rakai, and they disempower to the Rohingyas. So during that time, they had lots of like mass violence, mass atrocity. So the when the when the Second World War like uh, Rakai were pushed out to the north, southern so Rakai state, and when the Japanese came. And Rakhai pushed back to the like, Rohingya and the, the K mass atrocity, and they pushed the northern Rakhai state. So now the demography, uh, Buddhists are south, uh, not in the Muslims or Rohingya. And then, so, and then in the also in the Rakhai perspective, also the memories in the 90s, uh, 1946. The Rohingyas, the insurgents group, they are they want like, they would like to join the uh, northern Rakhine state with the uh, East Pakistan. Uh, I think for Rakhine that is a big thing, and also the second time post uh, independence, uh, the Rohingyas uh, Mujahideen movement, and they are they are asking the independence stake. So I think that two things is a like, big matter for the Rakhine state because the Rakhine is always they are they feel they are grievances because. Uh, because the uh, British are taken, Burmese king are taken their land, so they had this kind of uh, grievance sex. And then uh, 2012 community violence, 2016's uh, uh, attack, and 2017 August recent attack. That is uh, in Port Rakhai, that is like, we have to protect our land. And the Rohingya are taking the, our land. And this is like the, and that is the, in the state media as well as like government official and academy. They are generating these kinds of ideas. So the Rakai so poor, and then they don't trust anybody. And also there is no like uh, accountability. What happens? Uh, uh, grievance sex uh, in 2012. What happens uh, in the uh, Second World War? What happened in the in the arouse? Uh, Ali uh, eighty, and the Rohingyas also they feel the same thing. So there is no accountability. They are get out from the country, and they are in the Bangladesh in the camp. And so, so a lot of people like, and the government never take any accountability. So what happened two thousand twelve? What happened two thousand sixteen? What happened two thousand seventeen? Uh, that the, the conflict is escalating. So even though they are. Uh, repatriate back again. I think there will be more like big atrocity coming because we haven't, we don't, we don't have any accountability. So that is like what I would like to highlight the currently. Thank you, Chosen. And we can speak more about your experiences during the Q and A as well. Yeah. Um, 
Next, we'll have Umyo Nguyen, who will talk about his organization's work on interfaith dialogue uh, that pertains to the Rohingya crisis and beyond. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity in his, this very important panel with very Bami specialists. Um, I just wanted to highlight, you know, why I, we started to work for this kind of social cohesion, social harmony, so-called interfaith harmony, we use the term, and also our organization is trying to voice for the voiceless. That's why we are involved in Rohingya issue. We are involved in LGBT issue in Saibama. We are human rights based organization. We are involved in the citizenship issue. Because of citizenship, also very complexity in Burma. One of the writers in Burma who used the term Burma citizenship law, so-called 1982 citizenship law, easy to be a stateless, very difficult to be a citizen. So anybody, including our state councillor, current, our ICOM store, sounds really easy to be a stateless, according to the law. Whoever wanted by the you know military, even American easy to be a Burmese citizen because of its, they have decision me. So mean there is no proper mechanism, I think. So based on the fact, factual. So just wanted to, that's why we are involved in citizenship issue, particularly for non-Buddhist people who are challenges for citizens, even though they live several, many generations live in Burma, but they are suffering because of they are not Buddhists. So I mean that why this, you know, Ethno-religious nationalism, Burmese specialists, but it did not use new nationalism of Burma. Whatever use, that's definitely their apartheid policy already practiced in Burma. I, I, that's why we are started to raise this issue since 2000 around that. So because we notice hate speech is not so new. So-called dangerous space is not so new. I just wanted to narrate, you know, a little bit the background of the recent crisis, how anti-Rohingya move, movement shifted to anti-Muslims and already spread out anti-Christian as well in some area. Not only that anti-Muslim or anti-Christian, you can see anti-INGO, anti-NGO, anti-UN, that kind of settlement already established. If you go out outside the Rangoon, somebody said, I'm working in NGO. Oh, that, that guy may be betraying the country. That guy may be the terrible enemy of the state. That kind of perspective people already established. That's are very dangerous for their situation. So I noticed since 1989, after we coup the country in 1988, one of the book, it is spread out country-wise, started by in 1989, the so-called in Burmese, I'm not really proper translation in, in, in English, but he used a good very translation for the, one of the slogan of immigration I had, very good. <laughs> uh, you know, that's very difficult to translate into English, like, like Amyukta Maso Chausia, that I like to try to translate like, we are fearing or worrying to lose our race and religion. That kind of book. At the time, another military period, under the military administration, you cannot be a published even a single leaflet or pamphlet. So those times, the board is spread out all over Burma. Nobody take accountability. So in around 1993-94, the countrywide spread out that board. Even in some area in Mandalay, we noticed Mandalay is middle of Burma, one of the former palace before the colonial. So even a wedding, People went to the wedding, so they give as a gift, wedding gift, for that boat who came to the wedding. So that kind of situation, thousands or thousands of boats are spread out all over Burma. Nobody take accountability. Where is intelligent? This boat is not official book. We don't know who published. So but that boat are already included. How Muslims are terrible. How Muslims are trying to take the land. How Muslims are you know making the you know missionary marrying with them with full wife or give back a lot of children, something like that. That kind of hate speech or dangerous or you know settlement or you know how terrible way of you know like a Muslim like conquer like Indonesia was that Buddhist land. 
now is Muslim majority land, like Afghanistan was Buddhist land, you know, so called and and factual. To be to be honest, no reference, but they give a lot of reference. So that book has spread out 993, 94 countrywide. So in 996. We are noticed, group of people, oh, that boat is very dangerous. In the future, that may be making the problem, big problem in that country. So we are trying to write the letter to the minister at the time, the so-called religious minister, Gen Lieutenant uh, General Mew Nyu at the time. So at that time, Mew Nyu received this letter. Somebody uh, you know, took his rig and his signatory, his name mentioned. They call him, how you got in this book? How you got the information? He said, complaining the guy who, who are responsible to write to them, inform to them. So means they're not taking action for the people who are spreading this book. They're taking the guy who write, please take care of this situation. Will be very soon, maybe a big problem are coming. So that person has to be threatened. So that we noticed in, but practically they started 997. I noticed 998. Some area in Rangoon, some area in Mandalay, some area in Prong, we call P, attack to Muslims. I, I was at that time very young, so we are a group of young group who are trying to collect the information and giving, oh, it's coming group of monks or group of people. So something like that. So we are trying to engage So that time. So we noticed that situation. So in 2000, around 2000, we uh, started to raise awareness about for interfaith tolerance issue. We started to work for this issue without people awareness of these things. Is it to be a, you know, persuade this kind of racist movement for the future? Our country may be the ugly, ugly face. Now really started already for ugly situation in the country. People used to say whenever they came, Burmese people very nice. Burmese people very good nature. But I had now no more because of this resistance already hegemony discourse. So that we have started to work about that. So mean, I mean, that's a narrated already. So I, around 2000, I went to some place like in, I met one of the military high ranking officer, he already retired. I got a chance to speak with him. He just shared, he just got a shot, he said. I was in, you know, some area in Burma, you know, in, I'm in charge of some area, like some border area, not, not the Raqqa, southern area. One of the, our top military psychosocial war, people from the psychosocial war came to us and trained something like propaganda. One of the guy lecturers talk about the propaganda, black, black way of propaganda, brown way of propaganda, something like teaching like that. He talked about the brown way of pro propaganda for us, like, we published a book like Amnu Piao Ma That's the fearing we look to lose recently. We published, he just said like him, he going to show, oh, that book uh, product of ours, you know. So means that he shared with me that. So means that uh, they are very systematically, you know, pre-planned, well-planned, long time, making the tension, you know, hatred, you know, you know, that kind of. So that's not recent. So, under the name of the democratization, you know, they are trying to keep their power, the people who are wanting to keep the power. So they are trying to make it some problem. So that, unfortunately, for, fortunately, I think, the Muslims are the target. Uh, that's Rohingya are the most easiest scapegoating community. That's, that is one of the target. The secondly, the general Muslim, they already hate, make hate, hatred for Muslim because of this book and other book like, you know, different book already spread out. So that's our initial stage, they are arguing that. And now that's even a Muslim in mainland, it, they're not so safe to live. Very scared, very scared. So not only Muslim, but also, you know, people thought that after this, maybe in Christian, maybe, maybe in others, you know, country have to be very, so no more democratization process are going on. So to be under the name of so-called nationalism, so-called defending or protection of race and religion. So that's a really now very, very unique situation. That's why we, our organization also trying to do something, you know, interfaith you program, you know, 
and also the human awareness program, particular focus on religious freedom, freedom of religion or belief are already gone in Burma, I think. Because where I born the, the, the township, all madras are shut off by the racist group came. Authority and no protection, you know. So means that kind of the situation happening. Uh, you know, some area in Korean state, in the Christian church campus, Buddhist man came, he dreamed last night. Oh, that is the place of Buddhists. Something like the Babri Masjid in India. So, and then, okay. So, and then, so he took the land and built the pagoda falsely. Nobody take accountability. What is the law? This is a church, Christian church campus to build pagoda without approval of this Christian community. So forced to do it, everything. So means, you know, religious tolerance or, you know, uh, not so much. So city of, you know, diversity. Even I got a shot less. I will conclude this. Uh, I got a shot, you know, the, when I was to go into Southern Shen, uh, Northern Shen State, one of the ladies she is leading in the civil society community, she just shared me, she came to Rangoon last three weeks ago to attend some meeting. Sometime I have free time, I explored to the downtown. She said, downtown, a lot of Muslim there. A lot of mosques there. So that's, I notice now how Muslims are, you know, taking position in the country. She, she shared like that. So I got, I'm, I also got a shot when she, that kind of information shared to me. She, she's not aware of Rangoon, Yango. Yango since establishment of British in 18, you know, 50. Those people are, 99% of the population are Indian mix and Indian people, to be honest. So, so now after the 1964 nationalization, a lot of Burmese Buddhists are also present. They're almost 30% now in this downtown area. So she's not aware of that because she got every day the peer pressure and, you know, this, this you know, propaganda by the, you know, one-sided information. So she not so much aware about city center of Rangoon. So she, suddenly she saw that a lot of Muslim, a lot of mosques, oh, that is new thing. Like that, you know, Rakhine, oh, not only in Rakhine, but also even in Rangoon, we are so, you know, worried for that. So I shared that, no, this is like that. So it means that's how dangerous, you know. Not only her, but also many people like that kind of discourse. That it has many discourse already the, throughout the country. All print media, all, you know, I can say 99.999, <clears throat> print media, you know, and also the politicians, they are also driving the same way. Already, Sia Chosan already mentioned that, you know. So that's a real current situation, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Um Nguyen. And now, uh, say, uh Shweyo or uh, Jim Scott will say a few words. Thank you very much. I'm, I think, the least uh, best, least in, best informed in terms of the history of the Rohingya. So I'm going to be both brief, and I'm trying to save time for a number of uh, people in the audience who know a lot more about this issue than I, and who ought to have a chance to talk about it. The, I wanted to echo Mio Wynn's point that um, I suppose you are saying in one way or another that uh, in the famous kind of German rendition of this, first they came for the Muslims, but I wasn't a Muslim. Uh, <laughs> then they came for the Christians, and I wasn't a Christian. Then they came right for the Zoroastrians, and I wasn't a Zoroastrian. And then they came for me. So one might ask, I think, in, in general terms, why the Rohingya? 
one could as easily claim there are lots of groups, ethnic groups in Burma that spill across borders uh, historically. Why couldn't one say that the Mun are actually Thais? And why the hell are they on Burmese uh, soil? Why couldn't one say that that's true for a lot of the Karen as well? Why are the Shans not considered Thais? Uh, and part of that is an effort by the military and the state to claim the uh, the ex most extensive borders of uh, of the state. I'm not going to spend any time uh, today on the on the questions that animate lots of people. I think, which is, um, should the Rohingya be citizens? Um, except to notice that the borders of Burma, when they were fixed at the moment of independence, actually included the old Ahom kingdom conquered by the Burmans uh, as a concession to the Burmans. And that's why it included lots of Rohingya in the national boundaries uh, of Burma. The Rohingya, of course, uh, were eligible to vote and did vote in the 2010 constitutional referendum. Uh, and in addition, of course, and I wonder how Aung San Suu Kyi deals with this on a daily basis, there are thousands and thousands of Rohingya who were militants and went to prison on behalf of the NLD and the Demo democracy movement uh, in Burma and who are now declared to be uh, outside of the Burmese nation and outside of citizenship. If Rohingya are to be citizens, um, reasonable people can debate uh, the process by which that citizenship might be determined. But in this respect, it's, wor it's worth mentioning that most of the proposals uh, provide for the proving by documentation of residence and history, uh, when in fact uh, one of the consequences and not uh, the only cause uh, of the last uh, ethnic cleansing is that most of the Rohingya have no documentation at all and couldn't prove the first thing uh, about their, uh, their history. The, I think, however, the most important thing immediately is the question of human rights. Not whether the Rohingya are citizens and which Rohingya are citizens, but uh, in addition, as uh, Elliot pointed out, to the ethnic cleansing that has been going on since 1970 uh, over time, uh, this immediate crisis of more than half a million uh, people burned out, chased out, murdered, uh, and their livelihoods uh, and residences destroyed. Uh, it's, I want to emphasize, we're talking about more than a half a million people. This is probably the biggest ethnic cleansing since the Second World War. Uh, it's an extraordinary uh, event, and despite efforts by the international community uh, and NGOs and so on, it actually is uh, an event that is much less prominent in our consciousness and in our newspapers than it deserves uh, to be. That has a lot to do with the history of reporting on Burma um, in the first place. The um, I actually, actually believe that this event will cast an historical dark shadow over uh, the Burmese nation for the next half century or more. Uh, I think this is an event for Burma comparable to the Turks having to deal with the Armenian genocide, uh, with the Indonesians having to deal with the massacres of 200,000 and more people uh, after the 1965 uh, general's uh, coup, uh, with the what the Hutu having to deal with the extermination of Tutsi in, uh, in Rwanda. Uh, I think this will stain the nationhood and reputation of Burma in a way that Burmese historians and ethical thinkers in the next cent half century or century We'll have to some come to terms with uh, as now it's being uh, it's being buried. So it's a great stain on the Burmese nation that uh, I think uh, whether they deal with it sooner or later, uh, it, it will be 
a large boulder in the middle of the understanding of what the Burmese nation, even if it becomes a democratic nation, uh, represents. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, a I understand that the Democrats whom I admire, many of my friends, uh, are desperately concerned that a split on the Rohingya issue will derail the slow progress toward uh, democracy. And they're afraid to jeopardize the chance that Aung San Suu Kyi sees for a new constitution which will minimize the influence and power of the military to block civilian legislation. Um, the, but this is not only uh, a abnegation of responsibility, but what kind of democracy can be built on the basis of this enormous historical denial of the basis of Burmese uh, nationhood and, and unity? It's a terrible foundation on which to build um, a democracy and it is, I think, a desperately dangerous demonstration of the institutional impunity of the military that having successfully mobilized militia and the military to uh, essentially victimize, for the most part, uh, an innocent population. Um, this entrenches the military's impunity historically uh, and into the future. Uh, and my own feeling and my own doubts about democratization is that even if one imagines that over a 10-year period the, peri the process of democratization was successful, what has actually been happening on the ground, and this is in addition to um, uh, uh, Francis is uh, uh, talking about West Bank uh, and things on the ground. The military has, over the past many years, been seizing land uh, from peasants, seizing enterprises, uh, grabbing hotels, making titles to property over to themselves, uh, organizing concessions for Chinese and Thai uh, enterprise and Burmese enterprises. That is to say, they have been seizing most of the valuable physical assets of Burma. And so I ask myself, even if the transition to democracy is successful, after 10 years, what's going to be left to save? Because everything will be titled over to military commanders uh, and uh, and their entourage and the people in, in Naypyidaw. Um, I think that the task for historical sociology and students of culture is to understand how this hatred came to be in the first place. And to say, there's no doubt that it's, uh, it's not simply a figment of the military's imagination and com that is they have the they have come to be able to rely on the active complicity and support of the population uh, in general um, and uh, the fact is I think as uh, Yo Win uh, referred to the prejudice toward the Rohingya is an exaggerated version of a prejudice in general toward Muslims. Long before any of this began, I was always shocked when the question of the Muslim came up and my Burmese friends would talk about uh, the danger for Muslims. Uh, and, the, and here, what struck me is the gendered aspect of this fear and hysteria. This, the, the, what was often said to me is, they, Muslims, are stealing our women as if we own these women and they're only available to us, right? Uh, and so it seemed to me to be a kind of hysteria about loss of culture and religion that was particularly uh, exaggerated uh, among males and one might argue among some of the clergy uh, as well who've been propagating this for a long, long time, it's not uh, it's not new in uh, in Burmese culture, and there have been attacks. Uh, I'm sure 
people could add many other places on Muslims in Mechtala, in Lasho, in Mulyamine, in Mandalay, in Rangon, uh, Yangon, and, and so on. So this is uh, the Muslims in general, and in fact Hindus, I'm told, also live in a kind of constant fear that they may come under these attacks uh, as well. Um, and so we have, over the past 30 years, a combustible material has built up such that a spark of uh, accusation of rape uh, by Rohingya men can set off uh, a huge conflagration. So it's actually not interesting what is the particular spark, just as it wasn't interesting in the 1960s in the urban riots in Detroit and so on to ask what particular police stopping a black man resulted in the riot. The question is, how did the combustible material develop over a long period of time such that a spark would be able to set off a sort of huge conflagration? And that seems to me to be the kind of question that one has to historically ask, because unless you understand how it got created, you can't understand how it might be undone, rectified, uh, and mitigated. Um, it's uh, to ask uh, uh, how this combustible material was assembled, how it was reinforced structurally, historically, how it's actively aided by uh, military propaganda, of course. Um, how uh, the projection of the Buddhist and state to the actual physical boundaries is part of a national uh, project. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, something that's happened elsewhere in Southeast Asia as well. Transmigration in Indonesia is an effort to take Javanese populations and to put them in the out outer islands where they are seen to be more loyal uh, to Jakarta and the central government, to take Vietnamese lowland populations and replace uh, hill populations along the Chinese border uh, with loyal kin, Vietnamese, uh, people of Vietnamese ethnicity. So this is, uh, in a sense, in part, a kind of strategic problem uh, as well. And the question then is, why the Rohingya, why the Muslims? And to end, I guess, um, I think um, it's, it's not as if the United States doesn't have a lot of historical ethnic cleansing and genocide to answer for, I might add. Um, but it seems to me that the demonization of Islam by the United States uh, and by American political leaders uh, in which Islam equals Muslim and Muslim, uh, ISIS equals uh, uh, Islam and Islam equals ISIS, uh, has provided a kind of international authorization and certification for the amplification <laughs> of these prejudices. And so the world campaign against ISIS and the way in which it is uh, coded in directly religious terms rather than terrorist terms uh, is partly responsible for this uh, hysteria and the capacity to amplify it among the Burmese population. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to segue into a question and answer, or uh, discussion rather. There are mics on either side. Uh, as people line up, I'm going to invoke the prerogative of, of chair and ask a couple questions for the panel that they can consider. Um, I guess the first would be that I think some of the arguments that you hear are that democracy has unleashed uh, animosities that were all, already there. And I wonder what slips in behind or comes along with democracy and in the sense of the military, as it started to prepare for this liberalization, did what Jim mentioned, which was start stealing the nation's resources, liberalizing land markets so that when they owned the land, then they could sell it off. Land became no longer used for production necessarily because it became worth more uh, to sit idle and to be sold off as an investment resource than it would to produce rice, for instance. And so I wonder to what extent does some of this uh, violence, is it 
um, a product of a precarity felt by dispossessed peasants who are no longer provided for it, no, no longer provided for a way of producing and contributing to the nation, and are told, well, instead of you know being a good Burmese person by producing rice, you can guard the contours of this nation by literally policing its borders. <clears throat> and the second question would be um, the one about a uh, one about race or one about difference more broadly. Um, because on one hand, what's really interesting about Myanmar and anthropologists who have studied this have noted it for 100 years, is how ethnicity is a performance that is inscribed through stuff like what you wear, how you speak, uh, whether you can know a little bit about religion. And one of the really fascinating parts about Francis's book is a chapter on uh, a person he calls Ong So, I believe, who Mongso maybe, who goes from being Rohingya to being a Buddhist, and he, he fakes it, and he ends up making it. On, so there's a sense that if you do it the right way, if you act the right way, it doesn't matter what you are underneath. There is no underneath. And yet, on the other hand, Thira Guseira, probably the most famous uh, monk in the country, and one that the United States diplomats and NGOs have made the very foolish mistake of backing for a long time, got in front of the military last week and said that killing anyone who isn't Buddhist is not a crime. Uh, you can slaughter as many as you want. He invoked the, the past histories of Buddhist kings supposedly doing this. Then he, he stepped back and said, I'm not necessarily saying that, but he was saying it. So we have two different discourses of race or a difference that exist side by side, and that's fine. I mean, like, we in, in America know how confused we can be about our own narratives and our own politics and hold those two ideas or many different ideas in your head at once. But I, what uh, I ask this for is to lead to a third question, the annoying question that I, you probably are fearing, which is, well, where do we go from here? What kind of solutions can we think of uh, after you've heard um, a pretty bleak description of, of the scenarios, uh, I'm sorry, of the circumstances. And this isn't to force solutions where they don't exist. I think it's sometimes important to just be uh, upfront about things and say things are bleak and it'll take a lot of work. But what might that work look like? <laughs> I'm going to dodge the first question. Um, the second wasn't really a question, um, but you talk about ethnicity as performance. Right. Um, I think certainly there's this idea in Myanmar, as there is elsewhere, that you have fixed group of, groups of peoples um, that are unchanging across time, um, as if they sort of rose up from the ground as one. And that's pitched against this idea of Rohingya has been very much a kind of construct, something that came about very recently um, as part of this political project that I spoke of. Um, and it's meant, I mean, that's the sort of, I guess this idea of fixed group it, groups is, or f one whole body is a uh, sort of foundation of nationalist thinking. Um, and it presupposes that there is one unit of us and then a scattering of them um, and that we have always been one nation. And this is the idea that I think the Myanmar military has tried to put forward over the past sort of 50 years or so, um, is that we have this long lineage in the country. We know who you are. We know who our people are. Um, there are these sort of external or internal contaminants um, in that project. They need to be... Um, rid from the country. Um, but from what I found and what other people have found, certainly, and the work of Leach, I think, has been valuable in this, um, is that ethnic boundaries are very porous. They move around a lot. People can move between ethnicities. Um, so this idea that an ethnic group, an ethnic identity is fixed doesn't really bear up to the empirical evidence. Um, people become another ethnicity when that process of becoming leads to enfranchisement, and that's happened across Burma. Um, and the person that Elliot referenced, who I dedicated a whole chapter to in the book, is a 
Rohingya guy who grew up uh, near Bhutti Down, moved to Yangon when he was younger, realised that if he kept hold, if he sort of stayed true to the Rohingya identity, publicly at least, then he wouldn't be able to get a job, he wouldn't be able to sort of progress in life. Um, so he fudged his ethnicity on his ID card, which after the 70s everyone had to have their ethnic um, designator on their ID card. That allowed him to enter the army. I don't want to give away the story because you should buy the book, but <laughs> he got into the army and then he was taken to, and then he professed his um, belief in Buddhism, that he was no longer a Muslim, and he became uh, a functionary in the religious department, the Ministry of Religious Affairs, overseeing the conversions of hill tribe people from Christianity to Buddhism. So there's this huge irony within that. Um, the the next question, where to from here? I mean, I think first and foremost, there needs to be a deeper understanding of the complexities of the crisis, the complexities of the um, factors that are motivating the violence, both from a kind of strategic point, from the military, why they want this to happen, how they can profit from this, um, but also how these prejudices have been generated. Um, it's not just a sudden, uh, not a sudden eruption that emerged from, you know, very little. It's a condition that's been developed across decades. Um, and the Rohingya haven't been the only victim. There are these sort of, I suppose, tears of belonging in Myanmar, um, and they equal, or they often um, result in prejudices, um, even amongst people who are considered indigenous to the country. So there will be Bama who uh, resent the sort of hill peoples, for example, who they don't know particularly well, who have never really been incorporated into the sort of main body of the nation state. Um, and this has created a landscape in which ethnic identities are incredibly volatile. Um, and so international approaches so far, or international responses to the crisis um, over the past few months have been more, I guess, material in nature. So talk of sanctioning the military, or talk um, from the government in Myanmar of um, funding the development of Rakhine State as a kind of remedy for communal tensions, or to placate placate Rakhine at least, um, without much um, understanding of what lies beneath all of this. And I think first and foremost people need to, or one needs to kind of get to grips with that and develop this sort of deeper understanding. Um, that's the first thing that I suppose gives some sort of hope that one day we might be able to kind of untangle what's happening um, and find some sort of remedy. But yeah, I do echo Elliot's sense that things are very bleak. Um, there's heavy pressure on Bangladesh, on Myanmar government to accept Rohingya back. What they return to could be as perilous as their current condition, if not worse. Um, if they are pushed into these repatriation camps, they will likely be interred there for God knows how many years. Um, and the communal dynamic in Rakhine State is now so toxic that were there be to were there to be another trigger for violence, such as another attack by the insurgents, which is very likely, then that would provide another excuse for the military to sweep in and do, you know, finish up the job that they started um, more recently. Someone else? Oh, yeah, please. I will turn the stain to prerogative as a holder of a Burmese uh, passport to talk about where we can go from here. Um, so uh, Elliot started out by saying the tyranny of the, of the map. And I would add that uh, we have a uh, multiplicity of uh, traumas, baggage, and burdens you know, uh, on us in over many uh, centuries. Uh, and, uh, and some of them it's uh, codified by the intellectual fallacy of some British surveyors, particularly by Feyer, who came up with 135 races. And um, so I said that because uh, when we started democratization period, it is unfortunately became, uh, it, it became the framework uh, of to um, 
to to take the country uh, from there. So, for example, uh, in 2014 census. Uh, we were asked to choose you know, which race or ethnicity we belong to. A lot of advisors to the, uh, the UN uh, and also countries uh, that were behind that $75 million project advised the government not to pose that question because it is so problematic. We just had 2012 riots in Rakhine. Now, now we are asking how we should identify it ourselves. In Afghanistan, they uh, omitted that question. It was not on census. We could easily do the same, but we were uh, imposed. So, uh, and then that created a lot of problems. You know, there were rallying behind uh, people who wanted to identify as Rohingyas, and also Kachin worried that if they uh, identified as a subgroup of Kachin, you know, they would be divided up. So there was rallying behind uh, Kachin people to identify as Kachin, and not the subgroup of Kachins. And the Shen State, it was the opposite. People in Jiangdong area, Dachile area, they rolled down. 914, the other, or Daini, because you know, they wanted to, they don't want to identify as a uh, main Shen um, group. So what I was saying is that uh, we had a lot of uh, historical baggage and uh, the, uh, the, the trauma, and then we didn't probably go through decolonization, demilitarization. Now the whole democratization process is upon us and there is only one model that we should follow, right? Including the census, because the way to understand and interpret the world is through data, right? We need these kind of data and fast, but it backfired. After three years that or ethnicity or racial data haven't been published yet. So what a waste of the 75 million, but they claim that they use the data for, any, for other projects. Anyway, the other thing is that uh, I would say the uh, ink finger democratization process. So they take the boxes of democratic decision. Oh, people could vote. Now we have the elections. So it was all rosy and, you know, all feeling feel good. And um, I remember writing, uh, letters to newspapers like Financial Times. Oh, so, so you think that democratization period in Burma is over, now we have the real democracy because they ignore what is going on. They didn't take the boxes off what the army was not doing, where they're not killing anymore, right? Because under the democratization period, we stay had army killing in Kachin state. It, uh, the army, army ignoring all their own companies doing the mining. Now the whole village was covered with sleuths and everything. And so it was all conveniently ignored. <clears throat> and I said um, the other week, uh, the Western media disappointment and also the West disappointment uh, in Aung San Suu Kyi is a diversion away from disappointment in themselves because they are well viewed and uh, what I will call um, and uh, the, 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 the worldview and the policies are single-handedly shaped by her, right? So now they're saying that, oh, they're, they're, they, so since 2010 and since 2012, they were ignoring all those little voices, like, you know, like, like the works that they were doing. When they talked to UN, I mean, we would say, oh, why are you so pessimistic? You know, the country is not that bad, you know. We shouldn't do that, you know. We should focus and then uh, re-divert our energy to, um, institutionalization. This is the big words that they like to use. So I think the world also has to share some blame in it. And then it's, it's, it's again convenient for them to just blame, you know, the country. And, and also, uh, the, the um, Francis talk about uh, binary view. And I will add that, uh, and also Burmese society and also people uh, living in the country has been uh, viewed as victims, you know. So, uh, we, it's true that we have you know, long uh, colonial history and uh, um, the socialism and you know, militarization, but we are able to claim our moral autonomy, right? And it is only when we could claim our uh, moral autonomy and have moral clarity to say uh, things, you know, what is going on, you know, as it is instead of living in denial, instead of living that if you are against Muslim, if you are against Rohingya, you are not Burmans. So if people could start live, living out of the fear, or if, if we have more people like Gumi Win or Gutras, I think this is, this is a hope. And, the, and then these people have to be uh, encouraged and supported, not just you know, 
select a few groups of people you know, to support. So I will say that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, we have a lot of people who want to ask questions, so let's take a, a couple. We'll start with Jared. Sure. Um, thank you to uh, all the panelists for your insightful uh, analysis of this really horrible conflict. Um, my, my question is, uh, to what extent can we see what's unfolding in Rakhine State in relationship with the 70 years of civil war that have been going on in the country and um, instances of violence um, against other ethnic minorities? The Karen National Union just released a statement saying we regret to see the repeat of history in Northern Rakhine State, drawing a parallel between the um, attacks and massive displacement on uh, Karen civilians over the past decades. And, and so I'm wondering uh, to what extent can that um, sort of parallels between conflicts in different parts of the country inform our understanding of what's happening in Northern Rakhine. Thank you. Yeah, I just re-articulate the, the thank you. Um, my deeper questions were actually already hit on, so I'll ask a, a briefer question that's more direct um, for the gentleman on the far left. You, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, you mentioned that there was a lack of accountability between people, between tribes or groups of people um, leading up to the violence that we see today, and I was just curious if you could explain in a little more detail what you mean by lack of accountability in that sense. Um, and then you also mentioned a lack of accountability from the part of the military. So I'm curious how these types of accountability differ. Uh, again, thank you all very much um, for the work that you do and for speaking. Um, I just, um, I had a particular question about uh, the manner in which these atrocities have been taking place. Um, as you all were speaking, uh, the kind of technocratic uh, separation that exists here. Um, I think the, the comparison that was made to the Holocaust in Nazi Germany um, is, is something that rang out to me particularly strongly, especially in the story about the woman that had, that had no idea um, that there was a Muslim population in the capital city. Um, I thought that was very similar to Himmler and, and the trains. Um, but, but thinking about, um, I guess thinking about that and going back to a question that uh, was asked kind of rhetorically earlier, do we see, uh, I guess in your opinion, is the democratization uh, a similar kind of mechanism that is being used um, in separation from the people or uh, I guess by the military generals or by the people that are enacting this work? Um, is that kind of being used as a, uh, a way to usher in this violence um, in a manner that kind of, that separates the people from, from the actual act of the violence itself? Um, or is democratization uh, kind of secondary to this? Is it, is it in concert with the violence that is occurring or is it simply the backdrop? Um, yeah, those, those, three, oops, those three questions uh, are um, trajectories or connections with longer uh, um, histories of violence and counterinsurgency, and then the question of accountability and how that influences society, and then um, this third question about democratization and its enabling factors, or is, uh, it's, is it just a background of what's going on? Mewen, you want to start? Okay. Um, you look eager. Thank you very much, and I think that I think the professor already pointed that, and. Amma was already pointed that, you know, some kind of impunity issue is still relating with this accountability issue. Because impunity, a lot of atrocities have done in several years. Nobody, even the Constitution, are uh, not allowed to do revenge of the, to, to, to favor for the trial. But even currently, until today, stay impunity and keep going on the you know, atrocities in different ways. So, that I would like to say, I'm just so much, not too much focused on the atrocity issue because I live in Burma. That have to be a favor me to not too much criticizing for this atrocity because of my security. And I also, not, another issue is like democratization. Of course, the, the awareness of democracy is really, really 
very weak, I think. Government also <coughs> nothing to do any awareness of democracy and human rights. People in Burma who understood democracy means the majority will. Yes, of course, democracy is the majority will. But they thought that in this room, maybe six people are sitting together. Five people thought that these people are dangerous. We should kill him. Five people thought this be dangerous. We should kill him. So that majority will to kill him. That kind of awareness we have. The whole Obama, we don't want Rohingya. We don't want Muslim, that majority way. That's why our top, top people, they don't want to speed up. No justice and rules of law. I don't want to say too much about the rules of law issue as well, because a lot of rules and a lot of laws are about that, you know. <laughs> so, so you see, even in, you know, accomplishing the, the based on the law, already discriminated, already problematic, you know. So means the, another thing, of course, the, another thing is like, compare with the, mod, no moderate wise. The, already mentioned about the, even in some influential clergy, are uh, talking about very like, you know, supporting for this kind of atrocity. That means nobody like uh, stronger people, no moderate voice came up for defending for minority, for defending for the people are suffering or terrorized. So that's, we are noticed that. That's why the few people, I'd like to highlight some point, you know, kind of the human rights defender issue as well. That's directly linkage with that. Even in, you know, Facebook are really problematic, so-called social media, particular Facebook. So, so people, our trust, if you talk, oh, I know from the Facebook news, something like that. So actually, Facebook is not news. But they don't know that, oh, F Facebook news, online news. So that are really, really, really propagate. You know, that's why the anti-Rohingya hysteria has now spread out to become an anti-Muslim. I, I already mentioned this. But the same, like human rights defender who talk about for justice, who talk about for human rights, they also end a threat. That's also another issue, you know. That's without that, few human rights defenders are also talking about this issue as well. Even a difference of human rights defender in this issue always silent. So because not only our moral leadership are silent, but also a lot of so-called human rights defender, human rights activists, they they also silent. Among the civil society as well, this issue is very controversial. Nobody wanted to touch so-called under the terms they use, they're sensitive, so-called. We use him, always make joke, sensitive, so nobody touch it. That's why this issue bigger and bigger, you know. I like to focus on the accountability issue is, you know, that uh, means nobody take responsibility. That's, that, is, that is my perspective on that. So even now it also, how can I say in English, like pushing ball each other. Oh, somebody said this is a responsibility for so-called NLD government. Somebody said, oh, no, this is not a responsibility for them. This is the military responsibility. Who is the responsibility? The people are suffering. People are terrorized. People are daily. This is a human rights crisis. No time to debate for they are et ethnic Obama or not, or they are citizens of Obama or not. That's kind of issue. No, no bit wise, no like influential person came up and talked about. And I noticed in Indonesia in transition, like against the Christian, some point. That time, you know, like I noticed the Abdurrahman Wahib. Later he took as a presidential power. He after that he stepped out. He took stand up for the moderate wise. No, we have to protest for these our fellow Christians. So mean like that no person like him in Burma came up yet. That even though these so called influential clergy talk about, oh, this is not sin, who are killing non non Buddhists. So, like, I never heard this kind of discourse and this kind of narrated for Buddhists. Buddhists is based on peace, love, compassionate, and appreciate. That's based on the Buddhism. Thank you very much. That's my response. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah, I would say, like, rule of law is in Myanmar, is like, is a misuse by the like, policymaker, especially Aung San Suu Kyi, she always say rule of law. 
And then the problems that we have is uh, security forces and judiciary department are the weakest uh, institution in, in Burma. But also, like, less people are only focused on the policy making, but the uh, like, implementation of policy is very lacking. So that's why a lot of like, law breaking are happening. Right. If you look at, the, look at the single cases, like in 2014, uh, NGO office were attacked in my city. And the ICRC, recently the ICRC office, wa, ICRC supply were attacked. And then there's like, before that, before like August, uh, before it's like, uh, before August 25, finest uh, uh, Rohingya's uh, uh, attack, in such an attack, and like seven Muslim were uh, attacked and two, maybe one or two were killed on the way to the court. Right. And then there's like, any single cases, the law enforcement agency ne never takes any accountability. And then so like now, currently, like my say, I have to, I have to afraid of the security forces and the same time non-state actors. Uh, I think non-state actors are the more like spoiler who are really targeted like, targeted like activists. So that's why so I think so we have to start reform like judiciary department. But the, the very interesting is the judiciary department is controlled by NLT government. And it's not uh, administrated by military, it's administrated by the civilian government. But they never reform uh, the implementation. So I think that's, that's why. So that's why so the, the violence is repeating so constantly, and then so people are uh, expecting so the violent weekend, who is coming next? Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, that is my answer. Just a couple of things. It, it's interesting to me, the question is, who can, in a sense, curb the state? And historically, in Burma, it seems to me, there have been, um, aside, um, who can curb the military uh, when it runs the state, and historically in Burma, there have been only two national forces that have, in a sense, provided something of a break on, on the military, His, historically, even in the, in the democratic period. Uh, one of them, of course, is the Buddhist clergy, uh, who were kind of undone during the Nguyen period by a series of registration and the effort to control uh, the Buddhist, Buddhist clergy, at least a good part of it. Uh, and then the students, whose student union was dynamited, uh, and uh, the distance learning and the removal of universities. So there were the removal of two forces. And it was what was interesting to me in Hurricane Nargis is that rock stars and their bands uh, and popular figures were among uh, some of the few people who could mobilize large uh, groups of people to go back down and uh, kind of relieve uh, the. Uh, the suffering from, from Nargis. I think the way to start, the terrible, sad thing about what's happening in the Rohingya area is that we have no information about it. Uh, that is to say, these are crimes that are easily uh, hidden. And if I compare it to the history, for example, of the Karen Human Rights Group, who for 30 and 40 years have been collecting information in the Karen area, General, you know, or Lieutenant uh, Somyet came with four people in Brigade Number X, stole Ma Cheek's uh, chickens, uh, their pots and pans, shot another peasant who uh, protested. They have, they, in a sense, if there was ever to be a process of justice, they have the documentation. And then the question is, is proleptic justice, does the collection of this material itself serve as a kind of mild restraint on what people actually do? If they know that every move that they take is being monitored by citizens who care about human rights and care about what's happening in all of these places. Uh, and it seems to me this is the role of civil society to have the military understand that their every move is being watched uh, and that, and that um, uh, information is being collected uh, that might be used against them in future prosecutions. Yeah. Um, 
Not really. I mean, just to follow up quickly on Jim's point, um, I guess an issue with the Rohingya is that they've got no functioning civil society in the country that is willing to um, represent them or do the kind of um, heavy lifting that needs... Sorry. Um, there is no real sort of element within civil society in Myanmar that's um, willing to do this kind of work on the Rohingya. So it's left to the um, responsibility of groups that are now in Bangladesh who are taking testimony from um, the refugees who have left the country. And the government um, almost laughably, if it weren't so serious, has said that the exodus of 600,000 people is a kind of um, an organised effort to elicit international sympathy and to tarnish the reputation of the government itself. So it kind of, it almost mocks um, the stories that the Rohingya have been told, as it's done for um, decades now. Um, can, so we, can, we, can we take the three more questions and then we'll move back to your points? Yeah, yeah. although someone asked a question that didn't get answered earlier. Do you want to jump in on that one? Cool, just quickly. Um, how this relates to other ethnic conflict. Um, yeah, I think if we take it as a strategy to, on the state's part, to move into that area of northern Rakhine state and sort of colonise it, um, that certainly happened with other ethnic conflicts elsewhere in the country, um, right. as it's been the case with ceasefires as well, which are also another weapon in the regime's armoury to um, essentially move into a region and occupy it, um, whether indirectly or directly. Um, and it strikes me that while a lot of the other ethnic conflicts elicited broad um, sympathy amongst the populace, that certainly hasn't happened in the case of the Rohingya. Um, and I think many in Myanmar saw attacks on other ethnic minorities as a complete abdication of the state's responsibility, whereas they see attacks on Rohingya as enforcement of that responsibility because they are protecting against this constructed threat. Um, and I think that's kind of key to understanding how the military's gained such support. Uh, hello, thank you for your speech today. Uh, my, name's, my name is Yishem, senior year party science student from the Ohio State University. So it took me around 20 hours by bus to Yale today. So I'm going to ask three questions. So, <laughs> uh, so the first one is related to my senior thesis. So may I ask about the role of the UN humanitarian aid in dealing with the Rohingya refugee crisis? Because the humanitarian aid is basically just a short-term plan for the humanitarian emergency. So do you think the UN Security Council should politically stress the Rohingya crisis to force Myanmar government or even the whole state like Bangladesh to come up with some actions politically to ensure the Rohingya's social identity to ease the human rights violation situation? And the second one is, according to the census in 2014, so there are over 26% of people in Myanmar they don't have any ID card. So uh, which, in fact, the annual number might be even higher as many people were not, not at all surveyed. So as for Rohingya, what makes their social identity recognition so unique comparing with others also don't have this official identity? And the third question uh, is for, for for Francis. So, have you ever been to the other non-conflicted, Muslim populated area in Rakhine? So, as Chris in uh, Do and San Suji's uh, televised speech weeks ago, she just like uh, encouraged people to come to this area. So, do you know the reason why those people chose to stay in that area? Yeah, thank you. Hello, I'm uh, George Sen, and I'm a uh, Burmese American. Um, when I talk with Burmese friends on Facebook, they say that the international media is biased and that the situation is complex and you don't understand, you're American, you come from a different uh, background, that the citizenship here is not like how Americans define it. And I tell them why, like if you're born in Myanmar, you should be Myanmar. And how do you, promote a type of civic nationalism yes. and not this ethnic nationalism, not this, 
how do you broaden the concept of dying da? So dying da means something like sons of the soil. That you come from the soil, you belong to the land. Right? And if you don't, you don't. And so like, but how do you change that concept of dying da into a more broader of, you know, we the people? Uh, like how, like, and <laughs> what I'm thinking is like this Rohingya crisis, this, there's an immediate humanitarian need, right. and there's this long term that would take maybe generations. Like, how do you solve like, the immediate need and the long term um, vision of Myanmar, uh, of what Myanmar, who Myanmar is? Did you want to ask Okay, go ahead. We have a couple minutes left, and we're going to finish the discussion, and then we're going to play the film, which is not so long, if people want to stick around. Um, 15 minutes. I, I really thank you for that. I think the role of humanitarian assist for the United Nations, that really, after, 2000, uh, after August 25th, all UN movement banned in the Northern Rakhine State. That's why people are very suffering there. Um, they have a different reason to ban for these missions, but a lot of a lot of local local humanitarian group, so-called humanitarian group, they went there. But practically, people, so-called Muslims, who are Rohingya or whatever, they are not receive any humanitarian assistance. That's why they are suffering. That is the main moment and to push up to to move, to, to flat to the Bangladesh time every day. So not only in the Bangladesh time, not a lot of more than 600,000 you know, refugees there. We are talking about the repatriation, but nobody think inside Rakhine, almost 400,000 are stayed there. Nobody consider for those people too. So without they got the food and they, got, they are not accessible for livelihood, they may also flat again. So not only for the Bangladesh side, of course, we have to care about the, the refugee out there. The same, we have to also immediate work for those people. But current trip to uh, our Don San Suji trip to there, maybe something a little bit relaxing, I think, compared with the previous, because international pressure are also huge pressure. So that's why she went there and you know she kept trying to something, maybe compared with previous, maybe a little bit better. Hopefully, we have to be more humanitarian aid, need clean water, you know, shelter, everything, you know. And also the issue of the maybe other question, they may take it, right? So ethnic nationalism is a bit problematic in Burma. That is legitimized by the colonial legacy, I think. This is started by the colonial legacy because the different ethnic, different proud to be ethnic. Of course, they have to be proud, their own ethnic, but the same, they have no sense too much because that we are keeping the colonial legacy for this kind of ethnic politics and ethnic, you know, or nationalism, they are still keeping, and that very difficult to be a state difficult position for to be a reconciliation process. But nobody started to talk about for civic nationalism. That's a missing point. No politician talk about that, this civic nationalism. The same like, you know, even 1982 citizenship law is one of the problem maker. People want to be ethnic. Rohingya wanted to be too much ethnic, recognized ethnic, because if you are not recognized ethnic or ethnic, you cannot be a born citizen. You can be citizen with the, by law. So you have like another class of citizen. So that's 
part of the problem is this 1982 law. If you are not recognized ethnic, you cannot be a born citizen. That is another barrier. That, uh, most of the group, they want to be a legitimized ethnic because they are following the mainstream polity. Nobody are penetrating, you know, apart from this mainstream politic like that. So that's another challenge. That we have to be take time to do awareness about civic nationalism is most secure, the country, you know, that kind of thing, you know. That government has to be started and human rights groups started, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I'll just jump in on your questions, considering you've travelled so far. Um, on the, your second question, were you asking why Rohingya have such um, uh, suffer such persecution, even though there are other stateless groups in the country? Or yeah, my second question is: first, the Rohingya, they, now they have the white card, so but according <coughs> to the census, it's like there are more than like twenty six people they don't have the ID card so like in Korean state there is like 30 percent people they don't have the ID card so how to like make the Rohingya because they can pass to other identities so what make the Rohingya their social recognition so so you don't have that to other I see um, mm -hmm. I think I think there's a strong racial element to this as well that's fed by um, fears of Myanmar being overwhelmed by cultures from the subcontinent. Um, and because of perhaps more distinct facial features um, that are you know, more aligned with um, subcontinental groups, then they almost provide evidence that the Western border is weak. And the Western border has long had this moniker of being the Western Gate. And if the Western Gate falls, then um, Myanmar will be overwhelmed by cultures from the subcontinent. Um, so I don't think you can discount the racial element to this violence. Um, it's often talked about in sort of religious terms or ethnic terms. But I think there's a strong um, aspect when it comes to, you know, we can apparently identify Rohingya by their features. We can pick them out for attack. Um, the second question, uh, why do Rohingya stay in some areas in Northern Rakhine State and leave others? I don't really know. I do, the, I mean, the cynic in me would argue that the military deliberately left some traces of Rohingya communities there um, for the very reasons um, that we're seeing now, so that they or the government could use that as a kind of PR front um, to explain that, you know, our strategy isn't complete um, cleansing. The people who left did so of their own accord, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I haven't been to Northern Rakhine State since this violence happened, so I don't know what was particular about those villages. Um, I do know from the testimony that I got in Bangladesh that the military had what seemed like very clear, um, very clear strategy to massacre certain villages, torch certain villages, and then use those as um, warnings to other villages nearby that should you not follow, um, you know, should you not heed our warning and get out, then this will happen to you. Um, and that happened across northern Rakhine State. Um, but for those that do remain, yeah, I do wonder whether um, they are just proof um, for the military that they're not complete. Um, whenever we want to call it. Um, yeah, so there is still a range of presence. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add that uh, although I don't support forcible international intervention, if I were a Rohingya, I would ask myself and I would ask the inter international community why it is that the international community did intervene to save the Kosovo Muslims, right? Um, a comparatively small crisis of Muslims threatened in Europe, uh, and it makes no move to send, let's say, UN peacekeeping or monitoring forces uh, in a case that is uh, much more violent, much more extensive, uh, and involves more than half a million people. So if I were a Rohingya, that would be something that I would throw in the face of the international community. Yeah, so I, I was just going to answer. So like, 
I think so. Why the Sun village are left in Budirao and Mountor? I think the Malaysia why they are because the village are not close enough to the mountain, Mayu mountains. The village is close to Mayu mountain or get out mm. because they they use poor like poor color strategy. Right. So a lot of the village left are far from the the mountain. So military can the insurgent cannot stay uh, in the in the mountain area. I think that is one of the strategy the military are using, and that's why also the people. Are. I but I believe like if the situation is not improved. The people who are living in Budidao mostly, also they are going to live in very soon. And with the with the economical stuff, also I worked briefly with the London Law School for some study. So so if we look at 2004, 2012, like violence, and also the recent violence uh, in Chaofu or Sitwe or Mountos, it's all related with the like big government project. And I think the behind the Chinese are bigly involved, and that's why in the Security Council, China is against the uh, resolution. And mm -hmm. also, like I have, I have to choose the Rakhine Nationalist Party also receiving some funding from China. So the China is always keeping all like Western company out of from Rakhine State, so they can run the business. And then it's so very sad for the Rohingya. They are facing like the ethnic cleansing or general sex. So the yeah, so very involving the uh, business is the big issues in Rakhine State currently. Some rumors as well that area found out some kind of Shurinian or something like that. That's yeah. also another rumors, you know. Also like yeah, Chao Xiu, like the the Khmer are get out, like the Rohingya get out. They are building the seaport and special economic zone. The same the the village are bam down. And so if you look at that situation, also the yes. India bed in the seaport, and that is community who lived there in 2012. And if you look at the current conflict in the uh, in Mangdo, Kayin house, uh, like yes. as he said, and that is like the Rohingya community there. So they're kicking out. I think so. So let's so enter in the relationship. One last, one last comment, and then we'll do the film. I'll be very quick. Um, the uh, two points, right? So, and uh, the whether or not the economically disposes people join the conflicts. Actually, you could look at it the other way because a lot of uh, Rakhines that I talked to uh, in in Jiaodou area, which is uh, not very uh, far from, Mount, actually they said that because of the conflicts, they become dispossessed because there is no trade between them and the. Uh, Bangladesh anymore, and they used to be really good uh, with, especially with rice. You know, they could uh, export rice uh, to Bangladesh, and also go to go back to American uh, Burmese student point. The tie in that is. Uh, is is actually it's funny because if you are a Burman, you don't use dayenda. Mm -hmm. Dayenda is reserved for kachinka yaga So if someone say I'm dayenda, it means that I'm not Burma, right? So it is ironic that Burmans claiming that we are dayenda because we never say it in our everyday language. You know, if you say dayenda, it, is, it means that you are non Burma, right? So that that yeah. Again, uh, to go back to uh, the um, civic nationalism or the civic awareness, I think we have to start from very young at. At school, when you go there and after you sing your national anthem, uh, what you do is you have to pray. You have to say, say some Buddhist uh, prayers. And then if you are Muslim or Hindu or Christian, you stand out. So the making of the other, constructing of other starts very young. We have to change that. Otherwise, yeah, when you are like 10 or 10, 11, you know, the, the, in your head, you know, who is um, the other? Is, yeah, it's very vivid, and you know it. It actually detects your every the the action and thinking, and yeah. So it is very strong. Okay, please join me in uh, thanking our panel.